I want you to be inviting people out to the uh, revival. I know Dustin Duke's name is not on here. That's been pointed out to me, but uh, nonetheless, we can still invite people out to the revival, and uh, maybe it'll give them a reason to ask questions and to come and see. I don't know. But, uh, you know, just uh, want to be inviting people out. I'm planning on being out as much as I can uh, to try to personally hand many of them out uh, as much as the Lord will give me. Matthew 21, verses 23 through 32 is where I'll be tonight. But uh, as I was saying, yeah, just pray for me as I pass out these revival flyers and try to encourage people to come. And, uh, you know, God knows already uh, who's going to come, who's not, who needs to be saved and who won't. And, uh, but it'll be an encouragement to all of us and uh, always encouraged by revivals. And, uh, you know, as the Bible says, iron sharpened iron, even so a man sharpened his friend's countenance. And uh, Dustin has always been one of those who's been an encourager. And uh, he's definitely sharpened me in many ways. And so I'm very thankful to his ministry. But Matthew 21, we'll look here by what authority. We'll see here in verse 21, verse, uh, Matthew 21, verse 23. Through 32 is where I'll end. It says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people, they came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also, at, also will ask you one thing, which of you, you would, uh, which if you tell me, I will likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. So three times you see the word authority. That kind of gives you an indication of where this is headed. Verse 25, the baptism of John. Whence was it from heaven or of men? Now it makes a big difference if the authority is coming from heaven. But if it's from men, then there's no need to just to, to really... You, you, you can pick and choose just depending upon the man. You know what I'm saying? But if it's from heaven, it's the highest authority. And they reason with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why didn't you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go to, the, go, go to work today in my field, or in my vineyard. And he answered, and he said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second, and he said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether the, them twain did the will of his father. And so was it the one that... Uh, said, I'm not going to go. And then afterwards, his heart just pricked him in his conscience and he said, well, I, got to need, I need to get out there in that field. Or is it the one who says, I go, just paid lip service and didn't even bother getting up out off the couch and just stayed there and didn't do anything. And which of them did the will of his father? And they said unto him, the first. And Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots Go into the kingdom of God before you. Now here's the explanation of the parable, verse 32, and it says, John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterwards, that you might believe him. All right, well, let's uh, end there, and we'll pray for the message for tonight, and we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, and Lord, I need your help each and every time as I... Proclaim your word. There are so many today that's resisting the authorities that be. And uh, Lord, we know that every, every, every bit of the authority that we have here upon this earth, all of it comes from you. And ultimately, we're, we're accountable to everything that you say and everything that's in your word. And yet many will try to go their own way and choose their flesh over your will. And Lord, may you just do a work within our hearts and help us by the grace of God to lay down our wills, lay down our rights, and Lord, just submit ourselves to the will of the Father. Lord, we love you, and we just thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, when I was an ambassador, uh, 
I've, I've been through so much in my life already at that point. And, uh, you know, it's, I've been to the military in six years. I've worked many jobs. I, I've been out on my own. I've earned my own paychecks. I've paid my own bills. Uh, I've, I've been through quite a lot before I got to Ambassador. And I, I was excited about being there. But really, I did. I knew that God's calling upon my life was to be a pastor. And the only way that I would understand how to pastor if I, I had that extra help, which I needed, because I, I couldn't figure it out on my own. You know, there's a lot of people that's going to try to figure it out and do the best that they can on their own. I can't go by my own wisdom. I, I need help. You know, I, don't, I can't speak for other people, but I know for myself, I'm a little slow sometimes. I need a little help. So I, I was glad when I got to Ambassador. And then get there, and it's a small campus, and the teachers are, you know, it's, it's more of a smaller group, so there's a closer mentorship, so to speak. And uh, we were involved in a lot of local church ministries and soul winning, and there was a lot of involvement around there. But again, I was 29 years old when I went to Ambassador. And so, you know, they, they encouraged me. They said, this is what we want you to do. We want you to spend a year in the dorms. And uh, matter of fact, they didn't really care for that a whole lot. But I thought to myself, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know where any, anywhere else to get a, a place to stay, so... You know, I guess it wouldn't hurt to stay there on a campus and stay in the dorm rooms with, along with the 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds, the ones who don't even know how to do their laundry. And I'll stay there, and it'll be fine, and I'll survive. You know, I've survived a lot worse than that. So, uh, but one of the things that, that just irked me to no end, and, you know, I, I, I consider myself a pretty reasonable person, is that when I got into the dorm rooms, I found out very quickly they wanted me to sign in and they wanted me to sign out. They wanted me to tell them where I was going, how long I was gone, what the purpose in my going. And I thought to myself, you know, what is all this about? You know, I, I know how to take care of myself. I know how to manage. I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. I'm not some 18-year-old that doesn't know how to write a check. You know, I've written many checks. I know what I'm doing. I know how to manage a bank account. For crying out loud. And, and, and I discovered very quickly that many of the rules when it came to, to, to managing exactly where I was at and what I was doing, that bothered me. Now, if you're doing right, it shouldn't bother you at all. I mean, not that I was doing anything wrong, but, you know, I thought, because there's been times where I forgot to sign in and out. And then somebody would come up to me and said, you, did, you, did you leave? I'm like... I left, but what's the big deal about signing in and out? Well, if something happens, we got to know where to find you. I'm like, well, all you got to do is pick up my, my cell phone number, call me, and you'll know exactly where I'm at. You know, that, that's my mentality. But they, they, they treated me like everybody else, 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds. And, and Brother Tommy, that just bothered me to no end. It just drove me crazy. And some of the other rules drove me crazy when they went through my music and they said, well, you know, uh, you have a lot of good music here, but these, these tapes, these CDs that you have, because, you know, I, sometimes I, I use tapes still, the cassette tapes. I'm, I'm a little, I'm like the old timers. I'm resistant to change at times. And uh, I like the cassette tapes. And they said, you can't have this and you can't have this. And I said, well, I, per I, I bought those with my own money. What do you mean I can't have that? That kind of music. And it wasn't like ACDC or anything like that. I mean, it was just Johnny Cash. What's wrong with Johnny Cash? He's singing old-time hymns. You know, so I, I, I just had a problem with many of those sort of things. Now, I did, on the other end, I struggled. You know, there, there was a lot of things I had to learn. Uh, I didn't know how to dress right. When they told me you can't wear white tube socks with a suit, I had no idea why. I didn't know anything about how to dress or anything else like that, you know. I just, to me, you put on blue jeans and you put on a button-up shirt and you're good, you know. At that point in time, I, I did the best that I could with what I knew. But I've grown a lot since then. And there's a lot of submission to authority and really that's the first thing that people want to push off. You know, every one of us starts out that way. If you're honest with yourself, I mean, you're probably the same way that I am. You don't want somebody looking over your shoulder. There's a micro. I used to hate that when I worked at a job. And somebody would come behind me and micromanage everything. I said, if you want to micromanage me, why don't you do it and let me do something else? You know, I, I, didn't, I, I hated that. But even a little kid 
You know why the Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child? And that they have nothing but a heart of rebellion that's there that's got to be corrected? It's because they try to resist the authority that God has placed within their life, which is parents. I mean, when you look at it, when you get down to the everyday power structures of this world, it doesn't matter where you go, you're always going to have to submit to some sort of authority. There's nowhere that you want to go that you can resist. Well, you can resist it, but you can't escape authority. You're always going to have an authority. From the time we're born, we're always going to have an authority. When you go into the hospital to visit somebody, you've got to submit to whatever rules they have. You know, we got to submit to the taxes, submit to whatever rules are being made there in the government, and submit to whatever is going on in the world. You may not like it. It may not make sense. And uh, we may not love it, but there's always an authority that's over us. And uh, so we got to understand that first of all. And uh, let's see here. Everything in this world is built upon an authority, and all authorities lead to one thing, leads to God, who has delegated authority upon this earth. Uh, think of this. Pontius Pilate come up to Jesus, and uh, he was questioning him for his trial. And Pilate looked Jesus in the face, and this is when he, he, he determined, he, thought, he knew that Jesus was an innocent man, and they delivered him up for, for, for the cause of envy. And Pilate goes up to Jesus and he says, Don't you know that it's in my power whether to have you crucified or whether to deliver you? Don't you know I had that power? What did Jesus say unto him? Right, you have no power at all except for that which comes down from God. And we know from Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the higher powers, for there's no powers that be except that which has been ordained by God. And so, uh, all throughout our life, even somebody who says, well, I, every presidential election, it seems like, you have these movie stars get on TV, public television, and they'll say, if this person gets elected, then I'm leaving the United States of America and going somewhere else. You know what happens? They never go anywhere. What kind of thing? I mean, they're just spouting off at the mouth thinking that they, they're really impressing somebody. They're not. Now, there's been some of them that go overseas. Tom Hanks left for a while. And then when Biden got into office, he knew he was safe and came back. Uh, you know, that happens. But you know, when you go somewhere else, you're under their authority. You can say, I don't like what's going on in America and go over to Canada and you're subject to under their powers. But you're always going to be subject under... Uh, whatever authority that structure that you're under. So there's uh, the power structure of the home, the school, the church, the government, and so forth. And no one becomes a Christian without first submitting to the highest authority of all, which is God's authority. In other words, uh, this is what I'm saying. We got to relinquish everything about our own self. Because this flesh is condemned. God's already condemned it. There, there's, there's nothing that's good in this flesh. There's none good, no, not one. And we need to understand that. And Jesus said, well, God said that there's only one, one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And, and when we submit to the authority and, and accept that sacrifice that's given unto us and submit to Him, that's the only possible way. And so, you know, you can't... Uh, I guess you could... Well, you're still going to be held accountable to God no matter what you do. You know, so they, they have a problem that's there. And there's no escaping God's authority. But this is what the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders continually try to do all in the name of God. Can you imagine that? And they think that they're doing God a service by what they do. And look how righteous I am, what I've accomplished. And the things that I'm doing is, is good and God must be pleased with how I'm doing it. And funny how some of those same people who invoke God's name are the very same ones who stand in the judgment of God. In other words, even, even those in Islam who are you know, doing all these... Uh, uh, bombings and such, they're doing it in the name of Allah. They think they're doing it in the name of God. It's not. And one day they'll stand before God and be judged and condemned into eternal hell. Not everyone who says that they're doing what they do in the name of God 
It was actually doing it in the name of God. And so we've got to be careful about that. Uh, the Bible says that the one who denies God, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Bible says that the one who ha- uh, says that I have power to live my life any way that I please, the Bible says that that person, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. The Bible says to the person who says, no one, no one can judge me but God, prepare to meet thy God. And we know that it is appointed that a man wants to die. And then the judgment. Uh, no one ever has more authority than Christ. No one ever has been more submissive than the Son of God to the Father. Isn't that something? All power in heaven and earth has been delivered unto Jesus Christ. He's the one that can controls the winds and the waves. He's the one that knows the thoughts and the intents of the men. He's the one who keeps the world in perfect working motion. I mean, He has all the powers that be. He is God Himself. And yet He's submissive to everything that the Father says. So much so that when He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and He's praying, not my will, but Thy will be done. Submissive in every way as a son. And uh, so the words of Jesus is the very words of God. And if any man would do His will... He should know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's Jesus' words. Uh, The words of Jesus were the words of God. His works were the works that God has sent him to do. And interesting enough, Matthew 21 elaborates on this dynamic of authority and submission all throughout. So there's this uh, constant disregard by the religious establishment going through uh, Matthew 21 from the first all the way down to where we are right now. Jesus has come to the point in his life that he's heading up into Jerusalem. Now, he's coming to the point in the time of his life that, I mean, this is going to be the last week that he's here. And there's going to be a lot of events that's going to be taking place here when we get come to this parable. Jesus is getting ready. He tells His disciples, He says, I want you to go to such and such place. I want you to get a donkey, bring it unto Me. And He's going to ride there upon that donkey. And they're going to put their, throw their clothes on the ground and the palm leaves and everything else. And they're going to cry out, Glory to God in the highest. Uh, Hosanna to the Son of God. And, and, or the Son of David, I believe, is what they say. And so as he's coming on down through, the next thing we know, the Pharisees are all in uproar. They, they begin to tell Jesus and said, hey, stop all this. Don't, don't let this continue. These people shouldn't be doing this. As he rides in the fulfillment of the prophecy, you know, I forget exactly where it is, but he says, behold, your king cometh riding upon the, an ass and a court of uh, the, the the full of a, an ass there, and he says, your king come meek and lowly. And this is where they cry out, Hosanna, and glory to God in the highest, and now all this, this is fulfillment of the Scripture, and the very religious leaders who know the Scripture say, Jesus, you need to stop this, this is not right. And they resist the authority because ultimately Jesus is the King of glory. Ultimately He is the Christ. Ultimately He is the Messiah. And as He comes on down through, He goes riding straight to the temple. And what does He do when He gets into the temple? I mean, He goes up to the money changers and those who sell doves and sacrifices and tosses those tables over. And then they got another problem. And they say, by what authority do you do these things? And they're getting, you know, the, the, the Pharisees, are, they're getting very upset at this point. The chief priests and the elders and the Pharisees, their feathers are getting very ruffled. And then next thing you know, he's in the temple and he's teaching the people. And uh, they begin to cry. I, let's see if I can find a verse real quick. Uh, let's see, verse 15. Then the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were sore displeased. Sore displeased. I mean, they were hot. And Jesus said unto them, Hearest thou what thee saith? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of the babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise. This is fulfillment of everything 
God said it was going to happen. You know that temple over here that you're getting all upset about? That is my temple. It is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. I am your king. This is my house, and I do deserve the worship and praise. And they say, well, no, only God. Only God is to be worshipped and praised. And that was the very point. And that's what drove him over the edge. And so he, as he goes out and he heads up the Mount of Olives and he curses the fig tree and he comes back and then he goes back down into the temple once more and he begins to teach. And then this is when we come into the parable because this is leading into the context. But they come up unto Jesus and say, we got a question for you. By what authority... Are you doing all of these things? Who gave you the right to come riding into town on a donkey? Who gave you the right to overthrow the, the money changers' tables and to chase everybody out? Who gave you the right to accept worship and the praise of men? Who gave you the right to teach in this temple? We are the religious establishment. We are the teachers of the people of Israel. And this is where it all comes down to this uh, submitting to the rightful authority. Now keep in mind, Jesus is not only coming in and showing His authority that He has as He comes riding in as a king, as He shows His authority over His temple, His house as they've made into a den of thieves. And his uh, authority as somebody who is worthy of worship, but he's also submissive unto the Father because he is going to the cross to do the will of the Father. And he is submitting in every area of his life. Now, that is hard to comprehend as he's going to shed his blood on the cross for your sins and for mine. And uh, Jesus not only executes his authority, uh, but he's also submitting. Uh, as he will go to the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world and be raised again the third day. So this leads us to the immediate context of this parable and the reason why it's been given. Jesus has returned to the temple to teach the people. They ask, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee the authority? And uh, that's where we see that there's a question about that. So Jesus asked him, he says, I got a question for you guys. You guys are so smart. You guys have studied the law. And you guys know all about John the Baptist. You've been around. You actually went down by the Jordan River to ask him, are you the Messiah? And he says, no. And you've heard the preaching and you've seen the people flooding and you've heard that preacher of righteousness. Now i got a question for you since you guys are so smart. The baptism of John, where is it from? From heaven or from men? Well, they knew they was in the pickle then. Ah, Jesus knew how to get them in their own words. And so now they got a lot to think about. And uh, so the, the question here about John's authority to baptize, they, uh, they knew whose authority it was. In fact, that's what Jesus points out in verse 32. He says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But now they, they got these two options that they're trying to think through. They say, well, if we embrace John's authority to, to baptize in this way of righteousness, to baptize unto repentance. And we already know what John says in his gospel. There was a man uh, sent from God whose name was John. This John, you know, if we accept him, if we accept His baptism, that means not only do we, 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 we convict ourselves because we didn't come to Him for, for repentance, but also He is the one who looked at Jesus Christ after he, he, you know, before He baptized Him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so if they accept John and his words and his baptism as being from God, directly from God and his authority, then they got to accept Jesus as the Messiah and as the Christ, and they would ultimately be condemning their very own selves. You see? They're not willing to do that. Why? Because pride. Pride gets in the heart of these people. 
So they look at the second option and now they got another choice to make. They say, well, if we denounce John, then we also got another problem. Uh, if we denounce John, we'll have a problem with the people because all people beheld, they thought of John as a prophet. And we don't want to make all the people mad. We need them to, to, to have our respect. They've got to keep their eyes on us. And they feared the people. And so they could say yes, and their own words condemn them, or they could say no and be rejected by the people. Uh, they could face rejection from God or rejection from the people, but they chose the third option, and they said, uh, you know what, Lord? We really don't know. Well, that was a bunch of baloney. And that was their escape route to plead ignorance. And by the way, uh, John's Gospel again says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and speaking of John the Baptist, who came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him, through John the Baptist, might believe. And even when Jesus went to be baptized by John, he says, you know, I'm, Lord, I'm not worthy to unloose that latch it off your shoes. And he says, yeah. I suffered to be so for now, for righteousness' sake. The context matters when you're studying parables like this. And so when Jesus uh, gives this short parable here, four verses long, it'll end with an explanation in verse 32. Jesus tells us about two sons. And the uh, two sons here represent two different kinds of people. We learn who they are in verse uh, 31 and 32. But there's one son who, who hear what the father has to say. There's going to be a father. Uh, the father, I believe, that he's representing God himself. He's doing the will of the father, the father in heaven. But the father sends him into his vineyard. He says, son, will you go out today? Go into my vineyard to work today. And the first one says, no, I'm not going. He says, I'm not even, I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm not going. And then afterwards, he turns and repents. And the second one, he, he comes and he says, Oh yeah, I'll go. And then he goes not. And then he leaves and he doesn't do exactly what his father wants. And, 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 and Jesus asks the question whether the twain did the will of his father. And what Jesus does there, does there is he sets them up without knowing uh, that they're in trouble. And the question is for us, is which son are we? The one who's doing the will of the Father, the one who is not, the one who's paying lip service, or the one who's actually doing what God asks us to do, doing the work. There's a lot of people that will go out and they'll tell you anything that you want to hear. They'll approach unto you and they'll say, oh yeah, Pastor, I agree with you. And they'll go out and just act like I didn't even speak to them at all. There's other people that you can talk to and they'll say, well, thank you, Pastor, for that. And they go out and apply it and, uh, you know, they've been blessed. Not that my words is God's words. But, uh, you know, we've got to be careful how we approach uh, unto God. We've got to be submissive unto His authority. So I believe, the, again, the analogy for the will of the Father is to be understood as God uh, the Father. And before and after this parable, we find what? We find the baptism of John. And this is what Jesus is trying to nail him on. The baptism of John. By what authority does it come from? So it becomes important for the parable. And so let's look at the two sons. The two sons are the ones who heard of John and they came to John as he baptized in the Jordan because all the people were flocking unto him to hear him preach. And all that came to hear the mighty prophet published and proclaimed the word of God. He was the preacher of righteousness uh, as the prophets of God who came before him. You know, Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. I would say the same of Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets who came before. And he was even so a prophet of righteousness. And when people hear about righteousness, automatically their hearts condemn them. They don't want to hear it anymore because if their sins are pointed out, they, they said, no, I don't want any of that. I don't want to come to church and feel guilty about myself. I don't want to get right with God, and so I'll just push that away. But he was a preacher of righteousness and proclaimed the word of God. And uh, he came preaching the kingdom, saying, Repent ye, 
For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, if he says repent, that means God is also merciful and loving at the same time. Matthew 3, 2. John dispelled the thought that Israel could base their entrance into the kingdom of God based upon their, uh, their, their lineage. Saying, well, we came from Abraham. And John the Baptist said, hey, that guy, that, that's not going to cut it. You can't come to me and say that uh, in your hearts and in your minds as you approach unto me that we, we are Abraham's descendants because God can make even those rocks, to raise up out of those rocks to be children of Abraham. That's not going to get you into the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You need this baptismal repentance. You need to understand that you're a sinner and you need to repent and submit yourself to the authority of God. And that's what he's bringing them to. He says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God is able to the stones to raise up children of Abraham. And John spoke of judgment saying, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. That's the corrupt trees. And he broke down the idols of flesh and they brought them back to the commandments of God that they originally had been given. They come up to him and said, what, what must we do? Take, take no more than what's right. If you have two coats, I mean, be merciful. Give to somebody that doesn't have anything. And help them out. Uh, just do, do what God's Word says. And He doesn't tell them anything contrary to what God's Word had already said. And so it's like, why, why are you coming unto me? Why don't you just read your Bible? But it was a baptism under repentance because they had offended a holy God. Now the two sons upon hearing the word had a choice to make whether to obey or to be counted as rebels against a holy God. And notice the two people in verse 32. Verse 32. What's the two groups of people? But the publicans and the harlots believed him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. Which, which son would that be? The first one, right? The one that says, no, we're not going to go, they must have been from New England because they'll tell you straight out what they think, you know. Uh, you ask them to knock on the door and say, hey, you want to come to church? They said, nope, get lost. <laughs> That's what my wife tells me, so I, I just take it for, for granted, you know. I've, I've never done that up there, but uh, they... It was like I was telling my sister-in-law who was down here, she says, uh, yeah, I forget how the conversation come up. I said, but after the third year, I went to New, New England up there in Rhode Island. I said, I felt accepted after the third year. You know, as a Southerner, they were, all, they were talking to me in the coffee shops. That never happens. And uh, so, and plus, as a side note, I work, on my, I work on my Northern accent before I get up there, which they probably laugh at me and think it's hilarious. But nonetheless, that's neither here nor there. But the second son, the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders are the second son. The very thought would have been repulsive into the Jewish, into the religious Jews that they would have been guilty of sin. And again, it comes down to the controversy, age-old controversy between words and works. But the second son with the words, he just said something and nothing happened. But the second son demonstrated his repentance and his works that he had done uh, of saying and doing, however righteous and secure that the religious established and thought that they were with God. Jesus begins to show them, hey, you guys are not as righteous as you think that you are. It's not how righteous you are. It's the ones who's going to obey. It's going to be the ones who go. The, the harlots and the publicans, they go into the kingdom of heaven before you, is what he tells them. And Jesus uh, contrasts exactly who, who the real sinners are, those who refuse to submit to God's authority and those who refuse to go. Now, notice the first group, the first son. And he's going in and, uh, you know, he knows he's a sinner. He's, he's open to it. He's refused the call of God. And the word came to him the same that it did to all the others. As they're there by the Jordan River, and they would hear this preacher of righteousness, and he's, he's just throwing everything out at them, and he, he knows exactly what they're guilty of. Not, not personally. Sometimes when a preacher is preaching, and, 
And uh, somebody gets offended, and they say, well, he, he knows all about me and what I've done. That was my, my wife. That was her testimony when she got saved. She came into the service, and she says, man, somebody must have told that preacher all about what I had done, and how dare they? Now, he, you know, he didn't know specifically who did what, but he knew the sins that were being committed, and he called them out for what they were. He knew. For these were unwilling and unworthy, though the Word of God came with such authority, urgency, and activity as it did to them. And it came the way that it still does come to us today. Afterwards, something happens. They're sitting there, they're hearing the Word of God, they're reflecting upon it. They refuse to go, but that Word of God is doing the work within their heart. It's eating away at them. They come under such conviction. And they say, who am I to go against the will of the Father? They realize they're under a great sin, and uh, you know there's a condemnation that's associated with it. And so they turn and they go and they do the will of the Father they, they, because they are pricked in the heart, so to speak. And the idea of repentance here comes from the idea of deep regret and godly sorrow. That's, that's what uh, it says, when afterward he repented and he went. So the first son, he had failed to father. He knew that he was a sinner. He says, all right, I've, I've done wrong. I've, I've messed up, but if you give me a chance, I'll go work the field. And I'll go. And he does go. And he shows the change of heart by what he does. And he shows the fruits me for repentance. And John says, you know, show me fruits me to repentance. It's by the ones who went out into the field. So that's what he's trying to show them. And then there's the second son who just... Nothing but words. Nothing but words. The first son went from no to go, but the second one went from go to no. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not going. But the publicans and the harlots were going to John, and they publicly submitted to the baptism of John repentance for their sins. Openly before everybody. There in the Jordan River, and there had to be a great multitude, and one by one to come in. And they would be confessing their sins. God, and just like the publican there, and the Pharisee and the publican, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God only knows how much wrong I've committed. Openly before everybody, they confess their sins and say, I want to get right with God. I want to give up my life. I want to give up this sin. I want to give up these habits. I want to give up these thoughts. I want to give up this attitude. I want to give up this anger. I want to give up everything that is contrary to the will of God. I'm giving up my life. And no longer am I walking by my own life. My own will. My own flesh. But I'm walking by the will of the Father. Essentially, that's what they're confessing. And uh, they were judging self and turning unto God for mercy and grace. But the baptism waters of John, there's, there's comes one who's to be identified with the people. There amongst the midst of them, there's Christ. And not only is there repentance going on to the baptismal waters, but there's revelation. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. And He says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus said on one occasion, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him who sent He hath sent. And the people would walk away from the baptismal waters with a new relationship. I mean, new, just brand new people. And they're coming up to Jesus there in the Sermon on the Mount and hearing the wonderful words of God. And I mean, they, Jesus is pronouncing those blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecuted. And he's pronouncing all of these blessings. And their faith of their heart resulted in works. And that's, that's the way it is with us. When we truly believed, I, I can't explain the change that took place in my life. I just know that it did. You know, all 
August 8, 2007, in calling upon the name of the Lord to save my soul, the faith that I placed in Christ, there was a change that had been made. I was made a new creature in Christ. And I can't sit down and explain to somebody how all that took place and what was going on. I just knew that a new work was being done because I said I can't. I can't do it my way anymore. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my Master. He's my King. He's my everything. And when I've called unto Him for salvation, I, I died there upon the cross. That old me, and that's what the Apostle Paul says over and over again, put off the old man and put on the new man that was created in likeness with Christ. But there's the, the faith resulted in the work upon their hearts producing an action and so when John said, bring forth fruit, meat of repentance, he was really, what he was saying was that true repentance produces fruit. And if there's true repentance, then there's going to be a change that's been wrought in your life because some people want to put repentance out of it and say, well, that was under the law, so we don't need repentance anymore. Well, all in all, we find throughout, even in the book of Acts and onwards, the word repentance is still used. So we can't just shrug off the word repentance and say, well, that was back then before Jesus' day and for John's baptismal waters and for all that. No, it's still, still for today. And that's where they get all this hyper-grace movements where they say, well, God just forgives everybody and so we'll just go out and commit the gross sins that you want to. And Paul says, you know, that's not the way that it works. God forbid that we should continue in sin. God forbid that we should allow this to go on in our lives. God forbid that we should go out and uh, just keep on living the same way that we always did. God forbid we turn a deaf ear to God. But the second group again is very opposite. And Jesus told His disciples, He says this in Matthew 23, 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and they do not. And that's just who they were known for. They didn't mind putting burdens on other people's shoulders. But they say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. Tithe, give, uh, say so many prayers. Um, whatever else they would come up with. They would tell everybody else to do it, but yet they wouldn't do it themselves. Very hypocritical. And that's why he calls them hypocrites over and over and over and over and over again. The Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders of the people went and they heard the words of John given by God and they would not believe. They would not repent. They would not work the works of God and believe on Christ and you think to yourselves, why are they so prideful? Uh, it's interesting to note this. When somebody thinks that they're so good, high and mighty and everything else, they're not going to repent. As long as they think that they're good, they're, there's no way that they're going to come. Until they are brought under conviction, it's not that God has His Word is returning void or anything else like that. It's accomplishing what it pleases. But it's that pride that gets in the way. The devil's blinded the minds of them that are lost. And so as these religious leaders approach unto them, they said, we're good. We don't need to be baptized under repentance. We're looking for the Messiah, but not to save us from our sins. We're looking for the Messiah to go and, and deliver us from this Roman government that's over top of us. They're not looking they're not looking for salvation from sin. And that's their problem. And they misunderstood the kingdom of God. They misunderstood the Messiah. They misunderstood heaven. They misunderstood the word of God. John came by way of righteousness, and you believed him not. 
You have not submitted to the Word of God. And there's no repentance in your hearts to this day. And it was not just John who was calling men to repentance, but it was God who was calling men to repentance. In Acts 17, 31 in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men that He had raised them from the dead. And so the Lord nails them to a wall in verse 32. They said, And ye, and when ye seen it, and you heard it, and you know it, and you still refuse, and when you had seen it, you repented not afterward that you might believe Him. Who's Him? John the Baptist, one who said, pointed to Christ. And so there was a repentance, of course, that was going on because they were sinners. But John the Baptist also pointed to the one who took away the sins, which was Jesus Christ. And through, the, through that one, people were able to be made new creatures in Christ for the one who will go to the cross and die for us. And so it comes full circle. We don't want to acknowledge the king who comes riding in on the donkey. We don't want to acknowledge the one whose house this is. We don't want to acknowledge his teaching. We don't want his worship in this place. And they're telling it to the Son of God. They're renouncing his authority and say we don't want to submit to his word. That's pretty audacious, don't you think? They say we don't want you. We don't want your authority. I wonder sometimes why God didn't just strike them dead. God's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And they, as a result, rejected God's authority, refusing to do His will. And they rejected God's activity of calling men to repentance and to embrace His Son. And they rejected the urgency. Go work today in my vineyard. I had a lot more that I wanted to say, but I'll just end there for sake of time. Um, but today, if any man will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. Today is a day of salvation. In study, I'll save this for next week. But Psalm 118, it's really an amazing psalm. You can go ahead and study ahead of me. But Psalm 118, as we continue on down through the second part of the parable, the first part, he shows them, hey, you have rejected the authority of God. The second part, not only have you rejected the authority of God, but you knowingly are actively planning to kill the very Son of God. And you know it. So, but let us... I was talking to an individual today and I told him, I said, look, don't come to me with all your excuses. That was put to me a long time ago. I was in a Pastor Camp's classes. Many a times he would put his finger down and he says, uh, what did he say? What is the words? It's funny. You, you could think of it before. I had it in my mind just a little... But uh, you know, you got to choose. You got to make a choice. That there's what it is. It's a choice of the will. As I was telling this individual, I said, "Don't, don't, don't come up to me with all your excuses. You know what's right, and you know what's wrong, and you know what you ought to do. And you keep telling me that you can't, you can't, you can't. I'm tired of it. You can. You just choose not to. You know what you're doing is wrong, but you choose not to." So don't, don't tell me that you can't. That's like somebody coming up to me and saying, well, I was born gay. If that's against God's commands and His will, He's not going to make you that way. He wants all men to come to repentance. He's not going to make you that way. You've got to resist your feelings. You've got to resist the body. You've got to resist the thoughts. You've got a choice of what you want to do. And it's either God's way or the highway. Most of the time we, have, we say it's my way or the highway. We're not the authority. It's God's way or the highway. And so let's, let's remember that. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much. we got a lot to pray about when we think upon these words. It's not easy to say no to this flesh. And Lord, I ask You, 
just to give us wisdom and grace as we, uh, in this body, Lord, no man's perfect. I, I admit that. There's going to be sin uh, just that's always going to try to come after us. But we've got a choice of our will to make and say, God, You are the Lord. You are the Master. You are the King of Kings. Every knee shall bow before You. Every tongue will confess. And, and Lord, I want to submit to You will. I just need Your help. But if any man will call upon You, I know that You'll help them. I know that You'll save them. I know that You'll change them. But the problem is not too many are calling upon You for help. Not too many are calling upon You for salvation. Nobody really calls out for You the way that they ought to, to seek You early. You said you, they should find You. But Lord, help us to have a change of heart and to seek You with everything that we have, heart, mind, soul, and body, Lord, which are Yours. You bought us with a price. And how dare us live for ourselves. We love You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.